Who in your life taught you how to honor God and build an altar unto God? Who in your life? We're talking about blood decisions, meaning like every decision you make is in your blood. But who engrafted that into your blood? Oftentimes, you'll have parents. If you ever ask your mother or your biological father, you ask them, um, how much money did you sow into the work of God? Some of them may tell you, God don't need my money. Some of them may tell you, you know, I gave this, I gave that. But you hardly ever even find amongst the blood transfer that you receive first in this life. The first blood transfers in, uh, transfusion you receive in this life, the first blood transfer that you receive in this life is from parents. But oftentimes, and you, you don't have to disrespect them. I'm just, I'm just showing you. I'm just showing you how uh, true worship is not in the blood. It's not in the blood. It's something that uh, you have to break out of tradition and self-righteousness and even your comfort zone to walk in this because it's not in your bloodline. Who taught you how to become unselfish and recognize that every time I receive money, the Holy Ghost wants to see me place a unique and specific amount of that money into his word. And I'm going to need that because I can't see my future. I don't know everything that's going to happen to me. I don't know everybody that's going to come up against me. I don't know every battle I'm going to fight. I don't know every sickness I'm going to encounter. I don't know every sin I'm going to have to overcome. I don't know every disease that's going to try to take a hold of me. I don't know every plague that's going to enter my city, into my nation. I don't know everything that's going to happen to me. But who teaches you how to sow and activate the kingdom of heaven? Who? Sowing is the royal bloodline of God that carries a lifestyle of lavishness. It carries a lifestyle of abundance and it carries a lifestyle, what? Mostly a favor. Divine favor is so important. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 15 says, a good understanding giveth favor and it says the way of the transgressor is hard. So favor makes your life easy. Favor makes your life pleasant. You enjoy your life through divine favor. Inside of the seed principle is the favor of God. It's him causing people to be generous to you and lean in your direction to help you, which makes your life enjoyable, worth living, exciting, it's the seed that Abram operated in when God promised him to be the father of many nations. He didn't just say, yes, Lord, I believe that. He sold and his seed was his belief manifested. If you don't manifest your faith, God can never manifest his promise. If you don't manifest your faith, God can never manifest his promise. The Lord, the Bible says, ministers seed to the sower. Many people are not sowers, though. But do you know that God will minister seed to you even if you're not sowing because you was created to sow? So he'll still minister, minister the seed to you because he's dealing with the office he has called you to, to be a sower. Think about it. You know people right now, they're not sowing, but God's still ministering seed to them. He giving them a chance to sow. So when the Bible said that he ministered seed to the sower, he actually ministered seed even to sowers that are not sowing. Because sowers is what they're called to be. It doesn't mean that's the oper operation they have chosen. Glory to God. God was ministering seed to Cain. Cain was not a sower. 
according to his operation, but he was a sower a part of, uh, uh, according to his calling. So when God was ministering seed to him, he wasn't sowing. He was eating the seed. He wasn't giving God what he wanted. And if he sowed, he'll make sure that he picked the amount he sowed. He didn't want to give God what God was asking for. And God was putting it in his power to sow a certain way. And he rejected that, Genesis chapter 4. He refused to sow that way. But God still was ministering the seed to him. And then remember, God even had a talk with him and told him, if you do well, won't I bless you? Won't I give you the harvest? Won't I prosper you? That's what he was basically telling him. Because Abel was following the spirit of God with the seed. And his life was moving beautifully. When you're, when you're sowing into God, your life moves beautifully. And you ain't got to be anxious for nothing. You got to take dominion over anxiety because it'll, it'll come to try to trick you, to make you uh, get nervous and anxious and think that things need to happen a certain way now, now, now. And when you see problems, you'll start saying, okay, this is the right time for God to deliver me because I'm going through problems. And no, you don't need to do that unto the Lord. Because I remember when I was sowing seed, I remember even experiencing times where it's like I'm about to get evicted. But really, I'm supposed to get out of that place that I'm at. So you might look and say, well, oh, this is the right time for the Lord to set me free. And then, then the enemy start playing mind games with you because you're in anxiety. When you're in anxiety, you don't have the ability to even discern divine timing. Anxiety is not respectful of God. Anxiety doesn't respect God's protocol. Anxiety does not respect God's way of doing a thing. Anxiety is very disrespectful. If you take a note, write this down. Anxiety is ghetto. Wow. 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 Anxiety is ghetto. It's a poverty trait. It's for poor people. It's for people that are malnourished in their soul. Your, when your soul is lacking, you're operating what? Anxiety. Your soul, when it is not at 100%, anxiety overtakes it. When your soul is not healed, anxiety overtakes your soul. Remember what I'm telling you. Anxiety is ghetto. Anytime you find yourself being anxious, you're also disrespectful to God. People that are anxious also link their life to other people's life and say, if they're doing it, I should be able to do it. So anxiety makes you stupid. It makes you stupid. You'll destroy your sanctification, your purity, because you see somebody hanging out. You see them partying. You see them un un unrestrained. You see them following their flesh. And now you, you, you starting to get mad, talking about, I should be able to do that too. I should be able to date. Sowing is not in your bloodline when you come to the earth. Robbing God is in your bloodline when you come to the earth. You got to be taught to sow. You got to be taught to honor God with money. Because when you come to the earth, it's in your blood to take money to build a life apart from God's will. When you come to the earth, there is a bloodline that you have to do things against the will of God because you're financially capable of doing it. So it don't matter if God don't want you over there. You're going to go over there because I got the money to do it. Oh, I just heard the Holy Ghost say this. When you come into the earth, your blood speaks to you on how to invest money in things that make you more wicked. Why do you think people go to the strip club? Imagine they sowing into a satanic apostle. They laying down money at a stripper's feet. The Bible says in the book of Acts that they laid money down at the apostle's feet. People that go to the strip club is at the altar of Satan worshiping satanic apostles. And then watch this here. A stripper is getting naked. Let me show you something. A stripper is getting naked. 
in Genesis, after the serpent deceived man, they, the first thing that they started telling God was they was naked. So when you see a stripper, you're looking at a person that is fulfilling the words of their Lord, Satan. That was the word of the Lord to, 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 uh, that was the word of their Lord, Adam. They made their Lord Satan. And remember, the word that came out of their mouth was, we're naked. And God said, who told you you was naked? You see, inside of your blood, when you come to the earth, your blood speaks on where you should place money so that you can become more corrupt. You ever seen them people with a little child and their child over 100 pounds? Their child just five years old is 100 pounds. Inside of their parents' blood is to destroy that child's health. Inside of the parents' blood is so money for diabetes to come into this child. See, Satan's will is flowing even in the parents. So, so they sowing money and overfeeding their child. You got sugar diabetes. These are all things, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, joint problems, joint diseases. All these things start happening, uh, uh, weaken the immune system. But watch, the parents are sowing into their own child's downfall. My goodness. David was such a sower that his seed invented Solomon's sowing addiction. David was such a sower that his sowing invented a sowing machine in Solomon. You notice Absalom wasn't a sower. So, so, Solomon was the sower. Absalom wasn't the sower. We don't see Absalom sowing, but who we see sowing? We see Solomon. Solomon is the man with the plan. Solomon is the man with the hands. Solomon had hands. See, some of y'all don't really got hands. That's why the devil could fight you and knock you out. You got to have hands to defeat unclean spirits and principalities and witchcraft spirits. You got to have hands to defeat poverty and lack and stagnation and curses. You got to have hands to defeat sicknesses and diseases. And if you got hands, your hands will bring the victory that Jesus established at the cross. You got to sow. If you don't sow, everything that the Lord did it's like he never did it. The cross, the blood is all engrafted and tattooed in the seed principle. The cross, the blood, can you write me that? The cross, the blood is tied into the seed principle. I originally said engrafted, but I know some of y'all... <laughs> Just in case you don't know how to spell and graft it. The cross. The blood is all engrafted where? In the seed principle. And see, because salvation, it came to man through sowing. Man can't walk properly in their salvation if they're not sowing. Because how are you going to do something opposite to God and expect God to manifest? Remember what I taught you, that evil is contradicting God. So how could you contradict God's way to get salvation to you and you expect to operate in salvation without imitating God? What did Ephesians 5, 1 say? Be ye imitators of God as dear children. You got to imitate God. Every time you sow the seed, you are positioning yourself 
to receive happiness on earth. Happiness in news, happiness in relationships, happiness in open doors. I want to say this, and if you're taking notes, write this down. Sowing seed gives you access to the profit of God assigned to your life. Sowing seed gives you access to the profit of God assigned to your life. The seed was made to birth proximity. The seed was made to birth proximity and also oneness. There are certain realms of your apostles, your prophets teaching. When I say apostle and prophet, I'm talking about the same person. There are sections of their revelation that your soul, if it hasn't broken open and sown into God, you'll be handicapped to understand it. Your soul will hear stuff and even misinterpret it. Because the, the thing that's being taught, the doctrine that's being taught by the Holy Ghost is a doctrine that is a raw doctrine. Meaning you got to be somebody that is intimate with God, engaging God and ministering to God for you to be able to eat that manna of revelation. The revelation is high. So if you're not sowing, your soul hasn't even been um, purged, enlightened, fine-tuned to even receive the doctrine. My goodness. I'm going to show you something. Let me, let me go strong on here. I'm going to go strong on here. Because, see, I wasn't even going to come on here, but the apostolic anointing came so strong on me. Then the Holy Ghost said, come on, let's go on here. The queen of Sheba did not understand Solomon's doctrine. We in the word. She didn't understand Solomon's revelations. And she didn't understand Solomon's person. Because she had heard a whole bunch of stuff about Solomon. There was people jealous of Solomon and Sheba. There was people that didn't understand Solomon. Some people saw Solomon as a womanizer. Some people saw Solomon as a trickster. Some people saw Solomon as a magician. Some people saw Solomon as a manipulator. The Bible talked about the Queen of Sheba actually being curious, not only about what he taught, but who he was as an individual. Who is this man? In one aspect, it looked like his knowledge is one of a kind. I can't acquaint no man that teach like him. I can't acquaint one man that talk about what he taught. The aggression and the obsession that he has to wisdom, it is widespread. There's people that endorse him, but then there's people that divorce him. <laughs> there's people that say that he's good. There's people that say that he's evil. She wanted to know what it was. The Bible said that the queen of Sheba traveled from Sheba. And what did she do? She brought a seed prepared in her bosom. She had it right there in her, in her possession. But she wanted to listen to Solomon talk. The Bible said that she wouldn't go ask him questions. She talking to Solomon. The Bible said that Solomon answered everything that she had on her heart. She was shocked. She was shocked that he had knowledge, not only knowledge, but he had a prophetic ability to locate everything that she was really trying to say. Because, you know, you woman, you don't say what you really mean. <laughs> and most times you don't mean what you really say. Oh, I love you. I need you. I love you. <laughs> Baby, you don't even know what love means. Solomon knew Queen of Sheba better than she knew herself. She was shocked. This man had the ability to touch sides of her that was unphysical. He was touching her soul. 
No, you can you can go meet somebody. They touch your shoulder. They touch they touch your chest. They touch your stomach. They touch your back. They touch your face, your eyebrow, your ears. They can touch your your elbow and touch your hand, shake your hand. He didn't have to touch none of her physical. He was touching her inner being, her soul, her spirit, the inside of her. Bible said that the queen of Sheba went and started sowing. She sold over hundreds of millions of dollars into Solomon. That's what the word of God said. Imagine she started sowing hundreds of millions of dollars into Solomon. What is the queen of Sheba doing? Because number one, she don't need a harvest of money coming. So why is she sowing like this? She don't need a harvest of a new house. She a queen. She living in a palace, palaces. She over kingdoms. She is respected amongst her land as a president. So what is she sowing for? She could see the glory. <laughs> she could see the glory. She saw glory while Solomon was walking. She saw glory. When Solomon came to talk to her, she saw glory. If Solomon stood and smiled or if Solomon stood with a stern face, she saw glory. Whether he laughed or whether he was silent, she saw glory. Every answer he spoke to her, she saw glory. Every doctrine he spoke, she saw glory. And this woman didn't care if other people, even in her staff, would look at her and say, Queen, you're going a little too far here. You just met this man. Why are you sowing all this money into him? What's going on? Like, what's, what's really going on? I mean, like, I mean, he ain't even proposed to you. Like, well, what's really going on here? Like, what? You know? <laughs> she saw glory. When you see glory, you marry the glory. When you see glory, you invest in the glory because the glory translates into protection and the glory translates into health in your body. The glory translates to overcoming sin. The glory translates to breaking free from wrong people. The glory translates to overcoming temptation and rejection and strongholds and persecution and enemies. The glory translates to moving and burden removing, yoke destroying, miracle working, salvation producing, blessing overtaking, grace abounding, money cometh moving power. The glory is a translation. So when you see glory, everything that you desire to see around you is in the glory. The queen of Sheba was sowing because she saw glory. Shh. I said the queen of Sheba was sowing because she saw glory. Not everybody could see glory. Not everybody could see glory. Seeing glory is a privilege. And what is it a privilege? It's a privilege for those that are patient. It's a privilege for those that pursue. There's people that's not patient and they won't pursue. They won't shut up and listen to what the spirit of God saying. They too fleshly. But this woman said, no, I'm going to slow my horses down. I know I'm in a position of power, but I'm ready for power that I never saw before. I know that I'm in a position of glory, but I want a glory that I've never experienced. I want to taste and see that the Lord is good in a dimension that I never saw before. This woman saw glory and she humbled herself and said, I'm going to sow my way out. Sow my way out of poverty. No, she wasn't poor. So she wasn't sowing her way out of poverty. She was sowing her way out of returning back to the way that she was before Solomon imparted to her. Sowing her way out of every tradition and every false notion and every false doctrine and false way and false mindset and false relationship and false concept and false doctrine and false way of thinking and philosophy. This woman was sowing her way out of backsliding and sowing her way out of going 
going back to things that she was set free from while Solomon was breaking yokes with his doctrine. Everything that he was saying was cutting off every yoke and everything that was separating her from her anointing. She was breaking away from everything that would revisit her in the future. This woman was sowing her way out. Why? So that she'll never end up back into the grip of Satan deceiving her and keeping her limited and keeping her stagnant in what her soul was supposed to achieve as a woman of God. And Queen of Sheba was so powerful. You know, she started shipping stuff to Solomon. So, you know, when you ship stuff and when you carry in wealth and you, 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 you handle in wealth, you know, you got to have people on the bandwagon. They got to help you carry that wealth. So, so I, I want you to hear me. The queen of Sheba was such a sower that she trained her staff to start sowing into Solomon. Oh. She had a staff sowing into Solomon, too. They knew that she was sending the gold and the silver and the gifts for Solomon. So they watched her sewing and she wasn't ashamed about it. She trained them to sew. If you're going to be a part of my kingdom, you got to sew into this one. Because now we done found our God connection. We found a way to tell God, thank you. We found a way to show our appreciation that I recognize that you, oh Lord God, is my source. So I'm going to go where your word is being preached in all glory and power, and I'm going to bless that. So you understand that the sowing of the Queen of Sheba was so historical, and it was legendary, and it was groundbreaking, and it was premier, and it was one of a kind. You know why? Because she was actually investing into the kingdom of heaven on earth, which was housed in a man's body called Solomon. That's why you see the Bible talked about certain women were sowing. Mary Magdalene, all these women, they recognize, I see the glory. I see the glory. Why am I sowing? Because I see glory. Why am I sowing? Because I see glory. And when I see glory, if I invest in that glory, my, my new body parts is in that glory. My new brain cells is in that glory. How my brain is supposed to think is in that glory. My emotions is in that glory. The joy, unspeakable and full of glory is in the glory. My soundness of mind is in that glory. My ability to break addictions. My ability to get healed from afflictions is in that glory. My power. My excellence. My perfection. My directions. Is all in the glory. The way I'm supposed to talk. Is in the glory. The way I'm supposed to carry myself in my city. Is in the glory. What I'm supposed to study in the word of God. Is in that glory. The theme for my day. Is in that glory. What I'm supposed to concentrate on in this season of my life. Is in that glory. See sowing. It is the technology of God. It updates the software of your life to the correct setting. There's no more glitches when you start sowing. There's no more witches when you start sowing. Because you're not going to allow yourself to operate in rebellion. Honor is what you're practicing in your bloodline. That's why when you start sowing, God start to teach you how to bridle your tongue and how to talk and how to look, your facial expression, your bodily language, how you spend your time on your phone, how you spend your time when you're in your city. Why you think that the Holy Ghost start dealing with you on that? Because now you, you are practicing honor in your bloodline. Who taught you how to sow? Who taught you how to honor God when you came into the earth? 
Huh? Who taught you how to pit yourself last and pit the Holy Ghost first? Who taught you to recognize money as seed? Huh? Who taught you? Who taught you that when you came into the earth, when God placed money in your hand, he given you a chance to plug into his power. He giving you a chance to tap into his will and his wonders and his, the working of miracles. Who told you that the seed is a plug? That you plug into the circuit of God for him to circulate throughout your life and favor you. The Bible said in Psalm chapter 5 verse 12 that the favor of the Lord surroundeth you like a shield. You need favor. And in the seed is favor. In the seed is favor. In the seed is favor.